Okay, welcome everybody. This is the second installment of our tour of Man, Economy, and State. So this is lecture one of the course entitled Production in the Market Process, where we're covering the middle section of Man, Economy, and State. And today's lecture is on Chapter 5. For those of you who just joined us, we have the uh, these PowerPoint slides are available in the chat box, so you can get them there if you want to have it locally. Okay, as far as the course description, I always do this in the opening lecture, but with you guys, I'll be very brief because I'm thinking just about all of you must have taken me. Well, no, actually, that's not true. I think at least one person in here, this is his first ever Mises Academy course, so let me just very quickly give the format. I'm going to give lectures Wednesday nights typically. Uh, as we're doing right now. So those are live. They're going to be recorded, so if you ever miss it, you just log back into Moodle and you can get access to it. Okay, actually, there's lots of people. Okay, I didn't realize that. All right, several of you this first time. Great. Well, welcome. So uh, you, uh, as I say, Wednesdays at this time, you're going to have the normal live session, but it will be recorded in case you miss it. And then typically on Saturdays, I'll have an office hours session so what's going to happen is usually by late Thursday, I'll send out an email to all of you telling you when the office hours for that week will be because it's at different times of day depending on my schedule. And also I like to move it around to cater to different to people in different time zones. So usually on Thursday, I'll send out the email. And I'll also remind you that if you're taking the course for credit, the multiple choice quizzes will go online early Friday morning and then they'll be open for seven days. And so you guys so just within that week you'll have to do the online multiple choice quiz if you're taking the course for credit. I mean, you can sit okay. here too. And then at the end of the class there's a, a final that I'll get. So anyway, I'll remind you of all Hello. the stuff as it comes along and you'll get emails. So make sure, incidentally, if you're never getting any emails from me and you want to get them, <laughs> well, then tell somebody. Make sure that we know about that. And uh, I'm not sure, who are the TAs for this course? Why, why don't you guys say who you are in the in the chat box, because I forgot to check on that to see who the, the TAs for this class are. But anyway, if you have technical issues, <laughs> issues. Okay, so Danny Sanchez Danny is saying that thing. Matt. Julie Land, Julie Land, I don't know how you pronounce that, sorry, Matt, is the, is the TA for this class also. Uh, one other thing, Danny, what, what, who do they send the email to? Can they use the uh, that generic address? Okay, yeah, I, I, I wanted to check before I said it out loud. So if you ever have any kind of technical issue, like you, you can't log into Moodle or something, send it to ta at mises.com. Okay, um, and then there's somebody with technical glitches in the chat box if you guys can address their concerns. I'm trying to think if there's any other generic things. So, yeah, basically, this you'll pick it up pretty quickly. Oh, let me say this. It's okay if you didn't do it for the first week because I know some people just registered and they're just getting in right now. In general, though, the... Um, in, in general, the the classroom lectures will make more sense to you. I think you'll get more out of it if you do the assigned reading beforehand. So like I said, I know some of you didn't know you were even supposed to, so you, you wouldn't have done it for tonight. So, so if you can, after today's lecture, try to obviously read Chapter 5, but then get ahead and try to read the first half of Chapter 6 for next week too, so that by the time we, we meet again next week, you will have gotten that week's material under your belt. Because what what will happen is, if you try to read it once, you might hit some stumbling blocks, and then when I go through it, it'll make a lot more sense. Whereas if you're hearing me go through it for the first time, you might not even know what I'm talking about, and so it'll be tricky. Having said that, I do try to make the lectures stand alone, in the sense that if you're real busy and all you can do is tune in to the lectures, you know, you know you're not going to have time to read, I try to make the lectures such that you'll still get something out of it. Last thing is a compromise. If you know you're not going to be able to read Rothbard because it's just you, you just know you can't do 60 pages in a week, which sometimes it works out to be. Um, but 
you can do a little bit, well, then at least try to read my study guide. So that, in case you don't know, that's free online as a PDF. You don't need to buy anything. My study guide to man, economy, and state is, well, a study guide. It, it, it tries to summarize Rothbard's arguments down to their essentials. So if you can put in a little bit of reading time, but you can't do the whole thing, at least try to read my study guide sections before the lectures, and I think you'll get a lot more out of it. Okay. Um, why don't we move on? Uh, I see people are concerned about the um, the lighting in here. Uh, I can try to, for next time, try to come up with having an alternate lighting source, but right now I can't. And also it seems like some of you don't have video at all, so I'm wondering if maybe it's on your end. But as far as the lighting in here, I, I, there's nothing I can do about it right now. Okay, so going through, so now we're on slide two, review. So here, Rothbard in the beginning of part five, so he's, in the first four chapters, he, he gave an introduction to praxeology and the way Austrians view economic theory, and he also reviewed the basic theory of a good. And he also even got into some of the principles of pricing. So, so he, did, he did a lot of stuff already in the first four chapters. Now what we're starting, and this is a big chunk of what we're going to do in this Mises Academy course, is to go through and um, study the principles governing production. Right? We want to get a sense of how is production handled in a market economy. And the, w the way Rothbard is going to tackle this is he's going to start with some very sim – some simplifying assumptions. Right, so, so we're going to – it's sort of like we're going to be peeling off the layers of an onion. So we're going to start out and do things very simple, make a lot of simplifying assumptions, and then think about production and how incomes are distributed and so forth in that very simplified setting. And then we're going to one by one start relaxing those assumptions to make it more realistic. So that by the time we're done, you're, if you've kept up with the reading and you've tuned into the lectures and so on, you're going to just have – a vision of how the market economy works, and, and in particular, how uh, the production structure is organized and how it responds to consumer preferences and that sort of thing. All right, so that's that's where we're going. But before we start down that path, Rothbard, in the beginning of Chapter 5, goes through and just does a quick review of some of the stuff that he's already covered in the first four chapters. For our purposes here, I don't want to spend – too much time on that stuff. The one thing I do want to talk about is Rothbard goes over the definition of a stock or a supply of a good. So what he means is he, he's, he's, he's refreshing our memory as to, in terms of subjective value theory, which is what the Austrians embrace, and Carl Menger was one of the pioneers in developing it, in subjective value theory, what does it mean when we talk about when we say, for example, that someone has 50 units of a good, and then if he buys three more, now he's got 53 units, what exactly do we mean by that? So what we mean is the person has units that are homogeneous with respect to the ends that the, that, that individual could put the good. Okay, so for example let's say we're talking about water and we might say that, okay, the unit we're thinking about is a liter of water and the person has 2,000 units of that. So now what do we mean? Because if you think about it, from a chemical or a physical point of view, what we're calling successive units of the same thing, namely units of water, wouldn't be the same thing, right? Somebody from... CSI or something, you know, they could they could look at what we're calling the 17th and the 27th units of water, and we're saying, oh, those are both liters of water, and they could say, well, no, actually they're different. They might measure them very carefully and say, oh, to see this thing right here, this is actually 0 0.98 liters of water, and this one over here that you're saying is the same thing. Actually, we looked at it carefully, and it's 
zero one liters of water. So clearly these are different things. And also we looked at the salinity or something of the one and we see that actually it's uh you know this one has more this one's more saline than this one over here. Okay, and this one we looked at and it, it has uh the certain chemical in it, it the measurement here is is uh one part per million, and this other one over here, it's actually 0 0.7 parts per million. So they're going to say, clearly, these are different things, and yet you economists are calling them successive units of the same good. So, um, so, so that's the, that's the issue, right? So, so what does it mean in terms of subjective value theory when we want to bundle a bunch of physically distinct things and call them all successive units of the same good. What it means, again, I'm just repeating myself, is that those distinct physical things could all be interchangeable with respect to the ends to which the consumer might put them. So even though what I was calling the 17th unit of water and the 27th unit, even though a chemist might look at them and say, no, no, their volumes are slightly different, for whatever re purposes I'm going to use that, whether it's 0.98 liters or 1.01 liters, it doesn't matter to me. That's not going to be a reason for me to prefer one over the other. Now, if I'm doing uh, a sophisticated scientific experiment, then maybe those won't be interchangeable. You know, if I'm doing something that really, re that if I'm putting it into a machine that has a capacity for exactly one liter of water, and if I put in 1.01, it's going to blow up, well, then those things aren't interchangeable. But for the purposes for which most people are going to use water, it's fine to say that this particular thing over here, since it's 0.98, is interchangeable with this other one that's 1.01 .01 liters, okay? Now, don't get confused. I'm not saying that people have to be have to value them the same. When I say that they're interchangeable from the point of view of the actor, that, that's not true. Because we know from the law of diminishing marginal utility that as you keep adding more and more units, the marginal utility goes down. Because what's happening, so here, these three examples, the, presumably for, for most people, given their preferences, the first units of water are going to be devoted to drinking, so that's the top left. Then you keep adding more and more units of water, and so after you've quenched your thirst and maybe you know, set some aside for you being thirsty down in the future, but at some point you keep giving me liters and liters of water, at some point I'm saying, okay, I've got plenty of water to drink, let me do something else with this water. And then you might say, all right, well, I can bathe with it, or you, you might cook with it first. It depends on the, the circumstances, but maybe you say, okay, now that I've taken care of not dying of thirst, I'm going to use further units of water to things that are less important to me, like not being dirty myself. And so you take a shower. So that, in case people don't know what this is, that's a, the famous shower scene from Psycho, where the... Uh, you know, there's a crazy guy killing the girl in the shower. Okay, so so that's true. And then keep giving me more units of water. At some point, I'm going to use it to wash my car. So that's the bottom right picture. All right. So the point is, those you know the the ten thousandth liter of water that I have, the marginal utility of that is very low. That I'm going to, because I'm going to devote it to relatively unimportant things like washing my car or watering my lawn, whereas the first few units of water, the first few liters, the margin utility is very high because I need it to avoid dying of thirst. So the reason market has, uh, yeah, the reason the market price of water is so low, the reason a given unit liter of water doesn't have a very high exchange value is that for most people, the quantity of water is very high, meaning they devote it to all, all sorts of ends such that on the margin, one more or one fewer liters of water isn't going to be a big deal because the, the end you could satisfy with it 
is not that important to you because you've already satisfied all sorts of things. Okay, so what does it mean now to say, though, that these are all units of water? Again, is that they're interchangeable for the purposes you could use them for. So what I mean is what I'm right now calling the first liter of water that I'm drinking and what I'm calling the 15,000th liter of water that I'm using to wash my car, if those are really units of the same good, stock, you know, part of the same stockpile of good, then I could swap them. What I'm now calling the 15,000th liter of water, I could actually you know, take that, put it in my drinking cup, and the water that I was about to pour into my drinking cup, I could use in the car wash. So I could interchange them that way. That's what I mean, that they're equally serviceable. So that's what I mean. So we're not saying that the use to which I put that 15,000th liter is interchangeable to me with the use that I put the first. No, they're not. And that's why we have diminishing margin utility. But the point is to say that this is a 15,000th unit of water, which is the same good as the, the first unit that I'm drinking, we mean the physical things are all interchangeable among themselves. That for all the things I could use water, drinking, bathing, washing my car, a physical substance that could do all of that stuff, from my point of view, is water. Okay, that's that's the idea. And, and again, just to, to drive home the point, remember, these things really aren't identical. The point is, though, that as long as they're close enough to each other that for the purposes that I want to use them, they're interchangeable, then it's fine. Okay, Rothbard talks about the evenly rotating economy, and this is going to be a very crucial concept in Austrian economics. And so let's spend some time discussing this. So what it is, it's an, it's an equilibrium concept. And it's what Mises calls an artificial construct. So this, we never see this in the real world. This is an imaginary construct, actually. I think that's actually the term Mises used, an imaginary construct. All right, so this is never manifested in the real world. And I think we'll, as we go on, Rothbard will... I believe, talk about different equilibrium concepts. Mises does it in human action. I'm pretty sure Rothbard does it in man, economy, and state, but so far we haven't hit it yet. So anyway, let's just talk about the ERE for right now. So ERE is short for evenly rotating economy. Okay, so let me just read this slide, a definition. So in the ERE, all the variables or parameters that affect the economic outcomes are held fixed. So you got Subjective preferences, resource supplies, technological know-how, population, those are all constant. In the ERE, things do change, but it's in a very predictable, regular pattern. So you still have, over time, as time passes, raw materials and labor and so forth, they're transformed into retail goods, which are then consumed. So you, you do have higher order, lower order goods that you know, uh, things are, are taken, apples are, are picked from trees, they're shipped to uh, a processing plant, they're smushed up into juice, the juice is then combined with plastic and put into a bottle, and then it's put on a truck and the truck goes to the grocery store, and people go in and they buy bottles of apple juice. So that still happens. So there is that process, there is the passage of time, but the point is, once you define a certain cycle period, like a year, every year forever after is identical. The same stuff happens over and over again. So that's why they, Mises called it the evenly rotating economy. Right? So I don't know if it was clear, but Mises invented this concept and Rothbard adopted it and is just using it himself. All right, so this is a, is a, is a static equilibrium. And... In particular, every, everything is perfectly predictable in the ERE because nothing ever changes significantly. Like I say, things do change in the sense that if you follow the life cycle of a given apple, yeah, it starts out as a seed that grows into a tree and then it comes out as an apple and they take it and they smush it up and it turns into apple juice and people consume it and 
then we know what happens from it at that point. But the point is, looking at the economy as a whole, the, the output of apples is always the same year after year. The stockpile of trees is the same. The population is the same. Now, uh, Mises at one point says, you, you can relax certain things. So, for example, d depending on what you want to use it for, if it's okay to have people grow old and die in the ERE. So you don't need to assume that people are immortal and that they don't age. You can have people being born and then growing up and working for a while and then retiring and dying. That's fine, but it has to be such that the uh, the population distribution is always the same. So that, for one thing, for everybody that dies in a certain year, there are that many new infants born. And um, so the total population stays the same. And then also, you know, the, the, co the, the cohorts of the different age groups has to be the same too. Because you, you wouldn't want in one period for there to be more workers relative to retirees. And then later on, the amount of retirees per worker goes up. You can't have that. Okay, so anything that could possibly affect economic outcomes can't change in the ERE over the course of a cycle. So that when the cycle completes itself, you're right back to where you started originally. That's the idea. So why are we, what, what do we use this for? What's the point of this? What's the analytical function of the evenly rotating economy? Well, one thing is, it abstracts away from change, and so there's no uncertainty, and so it allows the economist to focus on the equilibrium relationships among various parts of the economy. So, for example, if you want to figure out the determination of wage rates, well, if you try to do it in reference to the real world, you're always plagued by the problem that the entrepreneur might make a mistake. But in the ERE, there is no, there are no mistakes that are made because everything's perfectly predictable. So the worker in the ERE, his wage is exactly equal to his marginal product. So the ERE, when we're trying to figure out principles like, gee, in a market economy, what are the forces that affect the level of workers' wages and so on? If you first start in the ERE, that's a very simple baseline case and you can work out some of the general principles, and so you, so you figure out, okay, in the ERE, yeah, a professional athlete who um, contributes $2 million to the, to the team's bottom line is going to have a salary of $2 million, because that, that, that's the only stable equilibrium result that's possible. That's the only thing that could repeat itself year after year, is that somebody who contributes exactly $2 million to the firm is going to get paid $2 million. Whereas in the real world, you don't know necessarily that the athlete's going to get paid that because, again, there could be a mistake made in estimating how much the person's worth, or maybe it takes, maybe, there, maybe the employer knows full well how much the employee is worth, but is paying him less, and competitors don't realize that fact, or there's, it takes you know, a long time for them to find each other or there's transaction costs and so forth, but none of that stuff can happen in the ERE. That stuff is all whittled away. Okay. Um, the other thing, and this is, this is a question that I often ask at Mises University, so I'm giving you guys a little inside tip. If you go there and you want to, um, you know, you, you get through the written exam, you take the oral exam that happens at the end of the week, we'll say, well, you, what's what what's one of the the purposes of the of the ERE? What do we use it for? What two things do we distinguish in the ERE? Because this is something that Mises talks about specifically. He said the main thing that we use the ERE for is to distinguish between interest and profit. Now, as we go on in this course, will uh, the, these things will make more sense to you? Okay, so if you're if you're not sure what I'm talking about right now, don't worry about it, but just take my word for it. The primary function of the ERE, according to Mises, 
is that it allows us as, as economic theorists to mentally isolate and distinguish the concepts of interest and profit because interest is due to time preference. Interest is due to the fact, and again, we're going we're gonna to get into this, so don't worry. You don't, you, it's not that you should understand this right now, but interest, capitalists earn interest income over time as what are future goods mature into present goods because present goods are more valuable than future goods. So if you make investments in what at that moment are future goods, and then you wait as time passes, as the, as the time of maturity gets closer and closer, and now they've turned into present good, they possess a higher market value than the market value of what you put into them to acquire them in the first place. Okay, so that, that difference in market value, the fact that the market value of that asset grows over time because of the passage of time is interest. So there still is interest income in the evenly rotating economy. Capitalists still earn interest in the evenly rotating economy. However, the entrepreneurs do not earn pure profits because in the Austrian vision, pure entrepreneurial profit is reaped by people who forecast the future better than others. The way you earn a profit is you saw something that other people missed that you uh, changed the direction of the market economy and you took advantage of mispricings, that people didn't correctly anticipate the future. You saw the future more clearly than your peers did. And so because of that, part, you know, the, the, the gain in market value of what you end up with due to your superior foresight, that is pure profit. And that's what you earn specifically as your in your capacity as an entrepreneur in the Austrian vision. So Mises is saying in the evenly rotating economy, that's not happening because there's no uncertainty since everything always repeats itself. Everybody agrees with everybody else about what's going to happen in the future. So since that's the case, there can't be any profit and there also can't be any loss. Right, so there's still incomes. Workers still get paid wages. Landowners still earn rent from their land. And capitalists still earn interest income. But there's no pure profits being reaped by entrepreneurs. Right, so that's, that's what the function of the ERE is. And you'll notice, well, you won't notice, if, if you know this, um, the classical economists, they would often use the terms profit and interest interchangeably because in their mind people spent a certain amount of money on the factors of production and then the time would pass they would you know make the finished good and sell it to their customers and get revenue and typically the revenue would be higher than the total monetary expenses of the of the you know inputs and so the classical economists would often refer to that as just profit but as economics developed, we got more refined, and we started to isolate the components of that, of that gross return. And we said, well, no, you shouldn't call that whole gross return profit because some of that should just be considered the interest on the invested capital, that you, that you were going to – you you could have just invested in a very safe bond, for example, rather than going into a business venture. And so – we don't want to call the whole thing just profit. We want to make up two categories to isolate conceptually the different reasons for you earning that um, income. And so the the one thing is just the return on your capital that's standard because of the passage of time, and that's interest. That's pure interest income. And then the other part of it, you you could earn even more than that, but that's because you had superior foresight. So the idea is, just to give you one quick example, and then we'll move on here. The idea is that let's say I take I have a million dollars, and I and I think that there's a there's good business opportunity, and so I spend it on hiring workers and 
buying resources and other things, and they're they're processing it over the course of a year, and then when all said and done, I take that product and I sell it for one point one million dollars. So I have earned a hundred thousand dollars, and in terms of accounting, you know that would be called profit. But in terms of economic theory, you'd say, well, wait a minute. Maybe I could have bought a very safe one-year bond at 5% interest. So it, it, it's not really right to say that I earned $100,000 in profit. Really, 50000 of that is just due to the fact that I was willing to defer consumption for a year. So because I saved, I was able to earn interest of $50,000. Now, the 50000 I earned over and above that, that may be due to my superior foresight. And, and the way we know that is to say these other people who put their money into the safe 5% bond, why didn't they go into the thing that I went into? They had a 10% return. And so if we decided it's because they just didn't realize it would work, whereas I did, then we say, okay, I earned 10% on my capital. These other guys only earn 5%. So it would be wrong to say my entire 10% return is due to profit because you know, 5% of it, anybody could have earned 5%. Just that was the prevailing rate of interest. But I earned 10% because I saw something that other people missed. So they were all content to put their money out at interest earning 5%. I saw this opportunity and got a return of 10%. So of that, we decompose it and say five of it is just my standard return on interest, but the other 5% is due to my superior entrepreneurial foresight. Okay, so again, I'm just jumping ahead. This is the kind of stuff that we're going to look at very carefully over the coming weeks. When all is said and done, you're going to have a very crisp understanding of the principles I'm talking about right now. I'm just trying to give you a big picture idea of where we're going. But for right now, again, in the ERE, we can easily separate those things because there is no change. There's no uncertainty, so there can be no pure profit. You can't have one entrepreneur with better foresight than somebody else, so that's all zero, but yet capitalists can still earn interest income. And uh, by week three, you will totally have that under your belt in this course, how capitalists can earn interest income in the evenly rotating economy because we'll go through Rothbard. has got some great diagrams to illustrate this with numerical examples. I mean, it's, it's really great stuff, and that's why I'm glad so many of you signed up for this course, because this is really the heart and soul of a major part of the Austrian vision of how the market works. Okay, the problems. How How is it, or what are some problems with the ERE? I'll just list a few of them. So one major problem is in the ERE, there's no reason for people to hold money that Mises talks about the, the fact that if you, if interest, if there are positive interest rates, which he thinks there would be in the evenly rotating economy, and you know what all of your ex expenditures are going to be from now until the end of the time, right, because everything repeats itself over and over, well, then why would you carry cash balances? That would be silly. What you should do is uh, lend your money out at various maturities so that you get it back precisely when you were planning on spending it to buy something. Okay, so if I know, you know, I get my paycheck and I know that, okay, of this $1,000 paycheck, I'm going to spend $100 of this two weeks from now going out to dinner, well, instead of carrying it around your cash balances, you should go out and, and lend it to somebody for two weeks by a very short-term bond because then you can earn interest. But the point is, if everybody's doing this, then nobody wants to hold cash. And so you would have money prices would just go up to infinity, that the demand to hold money would basically go down to zero or near zero. And also, just more generally, the reason we need money in the first place is to help coordinate exchanges, to help uh, you know do sophisticated things where 
one person's going to trade something to somebody else, he's going to trade something to somebody else, and that person's going to trade someone else, and then finally they might trade with me. We might all be better off by that complex system of trades, but in direct exchange, we wouldn't do that, right? However, if we're in an evenly rotating economy and we all know what's going on, we all know exactly what goods I'm going to produce and what goods I'm going to consume from now until eternity, well, then that coordination problem that money in the real world solves kind of falls away. There's no, there's no doubt about who I'm, what I'm producing and who's going to consume it. And so you would think that we could come up with all sorts of ways to economize on holding our cash balances and, again, lending it out at interest. So the, so the point here is if we took the ERE seriously and thought through the full ramifications of it, there would be very little scope for people to hold money in their cash balances where it doesn't earn interest. So in the real world, we have we understand why people hold money, but it's partly because you're actually not sure what you're going to spend it on. Whereas in the ERE, you know exactly what you're going to spend your money on, so it sort of takes away the need to have money in the first place. So why is that a problem? Well, because we're using the ERE to explain the formation of money prices. And so it's a little bit weird that we kind of have to assume people are holding money and the people, workers are getting paid in terms of money and then they're using the money to go out and buy stuff if money really serves no role in the ERE. So that's one problem. Another big problem with the ERE is, if you remember, for those of you who are here for the first class, early on in Man, Economy, and State, Rothbard explained that one of the prerequisites to action is uncertainty because he said if the if the future is certain, well then you can change what happens, and so why would you act? And then, but yet the uh, in the ERE, you know, we we kind of think there's action, right? We're using it as a as a benchmark to um, to explain the market economy. And so, I mean, I, I guess, to, depending on their philosophy, Austrians might go one way or the other on this, but the point is there, it looks like there wouldn't be action in the ERE, and so it's a little bit weird that we're using that as a way to understand the market economy, to understand human action, just like it's a little bit weird that we're using the ERE to understand market prices when people wouldn't hold money in the ERE or they wouldn't need to hold much of it. Okay, so j just to make sure you guys understand what's going on here, it's not that I, as an outsider, am criticizing the ERE. Mises himself is, is fully aware of these sorts of problems, and, but he just says, hey, there, there's no way around this. That we, For the limited purposes uh, that I'm going to use it for, the ERE is useful and it's indispensable. But he says we got to be careful uh, and not to not to rely too heavily on it because it does have these problems. All right, so there are just so you know, I'm not going to get into it now because we got to move on. There are some Austrians who say we we should drop the ERE. That they say that it's a bogus concept and Austrians of all economists shouldn't be using what they themselves admit is an unrealistic construct weren't we Austrians supposed to be the realistic ones? Don't we chastise the neoclassicals for starting off with false assumptions and building their models you know, on these false assumptions and then justifying it by saying, well, it helps us interpret the real world, so how can we Austrians use the ERE? Aren't we doing the same thing? So th there, are, there are those strands of criticism out there, uh, but for our purposes, we're just going through man economy and state right now where he definitely uses the ERE. All right, Rothbard has some good criticisms of mathematical economics. Let me just point out a few of his arguments and make sure you follow what's going on. So one thing he says is he contrasts mathematical economics with more logical verbal analysis. And he says that the... Um, he says a lot of stuff, but let me just 
paraphrase one of the arguments. One of the arguments goes like this. He says, you don't gain anything by taking a logical, verbal, philosophical type of argument, translating it into mathematical symbols, then doing some operations on the symbols, and then when you get the answer that's in symbolic form, well, you, you don't know what that means, so you have to turn it back into English or whatever your spoken language is. So Robert is saying that why go through all that rigmarole because ultimately, in order for you as an economist to be able to draw conclusions from the analysis, you have to start out with logical, verbal, if you will, premises and concepts, and then turn them into the math, and then, when all of a sudden done, take the math and turn it back into the, the spoken language. So why do that? Why not just stick with the spoken language and derive things in that realm, because he said there's there's a, there's danger there's a danger there that if you go into the math you might do something there that's actually invalid according to standard logical analysis, but you won't realize it because you're going to get distracted by all the math and you're going to you're going to lose your moorings, you're going to forget the simplifications that you made in order to translate the problem into math, and then you might do something that's correct mathematically, but it's wrong economically, but you won't know it because you're in the realm of the math model. And then you'll come back and reach an absurdity, whereas if you had just stuck with the realistic, logical, verbal analysis, you wouldn't have made that mistake. All right, okay, so that's the, um, th that's what he's uh, saying, that, or that's one of his arguments. Let me... Just as, as in terms of devil's advocate, let me just give the obvious response to that. And again, I'm not taking sides. I just want you to, to be aware. Somebody, a mathematical economist would say, no, Rothbard, it's the exact opposite of what you're saying. The reason we want to translate stuff into symbolism is precisely to make sure our arguments are valid. Because when you, tr when you do it in math, you can be sure that you're not, um, you, you can spell the argument out more clearly. It's more obvious if you're making an invalid leap in your arguments, if it's in symbolic form. Whereas if you're doing it in words, you, your argument might turn on the fact that you're being a little bit ambiguous about what a term means. Whereas if you, if you translate it into math, there's no ambiguity in what you're saying. It's very precise. And so that's why we do it. Okay, so again, so that's... The um, that's what they would would say. So again, I'm not taking a stand at one way or the other. I'm just explaining what Rothbard's particular argument is and what a mainstream economist would say. So, so for example, I'm just trying to make this more realistic or more concrete for you guys. Let's say, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Okay, something like um, in the in the area of or this concept of predatory pricing that that this one will work. Okay, so the issue of predatory pricing, where the claim is that in a market economy, sometimes people will uh, sell like one firm might sell below cost and drive everybody else out of business. And then it it takes over the whole market or virtually the whole market. But then once it knocks out all its competitors, it jacks up the price to well above cost. And so the idea is it, it can do that. So, yeah, it's losing money in the short term, but it's doing it knowing that once it knocks out its competitors, it'll be able to jack up prices. So that's the idea. Now, a lot of economists say, and including Rothbard, say, oh, that's a silly objection because that wouldn't work that once that that new firm, you know, once the firm had knocked out its rivals and jacked up the price, well, by construction, you're saying they're earning above, you know, they're charging a much higher price than they would need to in terms of the cost of production, that sort of thing. They're earning a much higher return on their capital at that point than other industries are. So why wouldn't people, ru newcomers, rush into that industry? Yeah, maybe they're 
the old guys had been knocked out during the period of so-called predatory pricing, but what you can't stop newcomers from coming in. And then they, they just stop there and they move on. But the problem is, and a lot of mainstream game theorists have looked at this sort of thing, and they say, well, wait a minute, that's not a good argument, because uh, if that first firm is serious and, and it has a reputation and, and people believe that it will keep doing that, why would an outsider come in? They might look at the firm and say, yeah, right now they're charging above average returns or prices, and we would make a lot of money if we went into that sector, but if we did that, they would just go back to predatory pricing and, and knock us out. And so why am I going to spend a year competing with them because I know ultimately they're going to drive me out of business? So why would I waste my time doing that? So so the firm, you know, knowing that it might have the power to do that, that might actually make sense strategically. Okay, so the point is, it now, and so now, you know, Murray Rothbard, if he had lived to hear that game theorist argument, he might come back and say, oh, well, the reason that wouldn't work is because blah, blah, blah. But, you know, the, the mainstream theorist is going to say, look, at this point, this we're, we're not going to get anywhere with words because, you know, you, it's not clear that you're spelling out all your assumptions and that what you're saying is internally consistent. And so we need to just make a, a little simple model. So let's come up with a production function and let's put in some numbers here. And yeah, when we're all, you know, when you're done formalizing your argument and see if you can create a situation where there's an equilibrium where one firm really can take over like that or an equilibrium where, no, that wouldn't work because you'd always have rivals who would find it in their own interest to come into the industry and undercut the monopolist. You know, go ahead and, and do that. And then when you're done with your argument, the rest of us will look at what you did, your little model there with numbers plugged in, and we'll tell you if we think that's a good argument or, you know, if you're missing some big issue. And some, you know, maybe you're forget you're leaving out interest rates. Oh, well, you got to have interest rates in there, so let's put that in there, and see if we, if you know. So that that's the idea. So that, but they're going to say there's no way we can settle this issue of whether predatory pricing makes sense at a theoretical strategic level if we're just slinging paragraphs back and forth. The only way to really roll up our sleeves and solve this is to start making simple models with numbers in them, or at least. With, you know, algebra, like to say, suppose the cost of production is C and that C is a certain, you know, relationship to the revenues, R, and so forth. But just talking in words, we're not really going to be able to solve this problem. That, so that's the kind of thing they're getting at. And again, my point obviously is not to tell you that they're right. I just want you to be aware of the case for formal mathematical models. Okay, another argument that Rothbard gets into is this issue of causality versus mutual determination. So, and this was specifically, uh, there was a mainstream economist who had criticized Bumbavark on this issue and made it look like Bumbavark was this obsolete fuddy-duddy. And so, uh, yeah, it was Stigler. So, uh, and Stigler says something like, Von Bauer clings to this quaint notion of causality and cause and effect, whereas the more modern approach understands that, you know, economics is the situation of simultaneous or mutual determination. So let me um, just make sure you get that distinction. So in the Austrian school, they do talk about causality, cause and effect. So what causes market prices? Oh, well, it's ultimately consumers' subjective preferences. That's what causes market prices to be what they are. That's the source of market prices that um, logically, in order for us to explain market prices, we first have to posit the existence of preferences before we can then start talking about prices and or, uh, you know, interest. What is the cause of interest? Oh, it's ultimately due to the higher valuation of present goods versus future goods. That's what causes interest. Okay, so that's the way Austrians talk. 
Whereas what Stigler is getting at is he wants to say that no, that's that's an old fashioned quaint way of looking at it. Now we realize that everything is it's just a matter of um the equilibrium of the system and that no one thing causes something else. And an analogy I think Marshall made up this analogy and specifically the context for Marshall was he was saying because there were two camps. One camp was like the old classical school that was saying prices were ultimately determined by cost. And then these newfangled subjectivists were saying, no, 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 prices are determined by subjective preferences. So one way of putting it sort of crudely is to say one camp thought prices were determined by supply and the other side thought prices were determined by demand. And so Marshall says, no, 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 prices are determined by the interaction of supply and demand. That it's not one or the other, it's the two things working in conjunction with you. You can't just look at one thing or the other. And he said it's sort of like picture a, a bowl filled with marbles, and if I point at one of the marbles in the bowl and say, what determines its position? What you know? Why is that red marble that's you know halfway deep in in the center of the bowl? Why is its position right where it is right there? You just well, it's because that's where all the other marbles are too. I mean, you, you, it doesn't make sense to say that the blue marble is causing the red marble to be where it is, because in turn the red marble is causing the blue marble to be where it is. And there, you, you know, you have to just look at the whole system and understand the forces they all exert on each other and understand how equilibrium is established and why now the bowl at rest is sitting there and the marbles are all perfectly balanced with gravity and against each other to talk about, you know, the final position resting point of that system. And that's the way Marshall thought about the economy. That, yeah, you've got subjective preferences, but you also have real cost considerations, meaning, you know, it takes a certain amount of labor hours to get these minerals out of the ground. It takes a certain amount of inputs to transform this stuff into steel and so on and so forth. And then it's the interaction of those things that yields the equilibrium outcomes. Okay, let me pick up the pace here. We're now getting into the heart of Chapter 5 and we're getting into the good stuff where Rothbard is going to start explaining the structure of production. So again, I'm repeating myself. In the beginning, to get us warmed up, he's going to make some very simplifying assumptions, and then, um, and then, once we get those down and understand pricing and the distribution of income with these very restrictive assumptions, he's going to start relaxing them one by one. Okay, so. The first thing is he's assuming completely specific factors. So let me make sure you understand what, what that means. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, I'm just doing a test right now. Can you guys see an arrow moving around? Okay. Probably 30 people are going to say yes. Okay, I got it, guys. Thanks. So this diagram now, we'll line back up. So completely specific factors means there are different consumption goods. There are different finished goods. You know, there's apple juice, there's orange juice, there's stuff like that. Okay, so we're not talking about one type of output good. There are many different goods. But the point is the resources, including labor, that go into making those goods are completely specific. So every productive resource, so every... Uh, worker and the labor he produces, every particular capital good and every natural resource is only useful in the production of one particular consumer good. So it's not the same consumer good, right? Each they all map to different, or they they may map to different ones. But the point is. Get, focus on any particular worker and you say, what can he do? And that worker say, oh, I can only make whatever. So maybe one worker, the only thing his labor is useful for is in the production of apple juice. 
but some other worker, the only thing he's good at is in the production of orange juice and so on. Okay, and it's actually even a little bit more specific than that. There's some worker out there, the only thing he's good at is producing apples. And there's another worker, the only thing he's good at producing is the um, the carton that holds apple juice. If you ask him, oh, well, why don't you make a carton that holds orange juice? He's going to say, I don't know how to do that. My labor is completely ineffective in making cartons that hold orange juice. But... I'm a you know a whiz at making cartons that can hold apple juice. Okay, so the, so there are different stages of production, and and so some of the goods that we're talking about here are themselves capital goods. So keep that in mind. So some workers, all they are good at is producing one particular type of capital good. Some other worker, the only thing he's good at is producing a finished consumption good. But keep in mind he works in conjunction with other factors. Okay, so now we're, we're ready to look at this diagram. So here, um, this P at the top stands for production. This C down here stands for consumption. So this one means it's a first order good, or it's like, the, or no, for first, yeah. The two is a second order good, and the three is a third order good. Okay, so what's going on here is at this, and at the bottom here, the C for consumption. So this A is some consumption good, and this B is a different consumption good. So A maybe is a carton of apple juice, and B is a carton of berry juice, let's say, intended for the consumer. So now, up here at three, we've got all these different potential inputs, these things up here. So the idea is that these three people, one, two, three, maybe this first dot, I'm just making this up, maybe this first dot is a, is a worker, and maybe the second dot is uh, an apple tree, and maybe this third dot is a guy who owns a ladder. And so they all combine in order to make the second order good, which is um, piles of apples that are in a, a big container. Okay, and, you, and you, so you see how it works. And then this thing over here, these people, maybe what they're making is uh, the something to, to squish the apples with. Like maybe they make a big hammer and that's what's going to be down here. And so then you combine these two things and so this is the this, this smushed up apples. And then these people over here, they're uh, making uh, the carton. And then these people over here, they make the, the label. And so then down here, we've got the apple juice carton with the with the label on it. And then finally the last thing is these come together down here where you put the um you know the, the smushed up apple juice into the carton and seal it up and give it to the consumer. Alright, that's the idea. Okay, so the point is so so notice time flows downward. That's what these arrows are showing. Okay. Why don't we move on? Okay, now, the, now we're starting to get to the really fun diagrams. So now, Rothbard's going to say, let's assume... So, so we, we discussed the, the, pr the production structure. The, the technology, if you will. Right? The, in this society right now, to keep things really simple, we're just assuming that everybody who is a worker or who owns some natural resource uh, is only good at doing one, at creating one particular type of good. It might be a capital good or it might be a consumer good. Now we're going to start talking about the earning of income in this type of world. And we're going to so make another 
simplifying assumption just to get the ball rolling. And then, again, later on, we're going to relax this. So for right now, Rothbard is saying, let's assume that all the people who work on a the production of a particular good, that they're all joint owners of it. All right, that, that will make a more, perhaps more sense in a minute. Okay, so here I'm trying to think of where to start with this diagram. So just to, to let you know, you really want to make sure you, you get this diagram because it's going to get a little bit more complicated when we go into the next chapter. And that the, the diagram, when this gets to be one more level of complexity, that's going to be the workhorse for interest in capital theory and change. And so for you to understand the business cycle, we're not going to actually do the business cycle in this course, but you're going to learn everything you need to know. And then at that point, understanding the business cycle is going to be a piece of cake. The, the, the hard stuff is what we're going to cover this course, the real intricate stuff about how did the cap the capital structure production structure of the economy change based on savings and investment and changes in the interest rate and then once you have that down and understand how it works when it works properly it'll be really simple to understand um how things can get screwed up so just just to give you an analogy uh let's say you're studying the human body and you spend a bunch of time learning about respiration and how, oh, yeah, you know, for a healthy person, under normal circumstances, the person breathes in and then the oxygen comes in and the blood flows through the lungs and somehow the oxygen gets into the bloodstream and then that carries it around and you, you get how that works and you understand, um, you know, at the cellular level, like why do we need oxygen and you understand how that stuff all works. So once you get how the body works, now if I say, oh, when uh, somebody comes along and puts a, uh, you know, puts a pillow on my face and holds it there until I die, well, you understand pretty easily how why that can kill me, why a pillow on my face can kill me, because you understand how oxygen, you know, how respiration works. You get what I'm saying? So the hard part there is to understand how a healthy, functioning human body works. And then once you get how complex that is and how the, the body has internal regulatory systems and all that stuff, then you can see why if somebody comes along and stops my ability to breathe, why, oh, yeah, that would really screw everything up and you would die. So, what we're like I say, what we're doing here in this chapter and then in Chapter 6 and I think Chapter 7 is, uh, well, it's the chapter that says Production, Entrepreneurship, and Change. I don't remember if that's Chapter 7 or a later one. But when we go through all that, you're going to see how if people will be in an initial equilibrium, then people will start saving more, and that will change the structure of production. And you'll see how we transition then to a new equilibrium with a higher, ultimately a higher level of output, a higher standard of living. So we're going to see how savings and investment lead to uh, the growth of the economy in a sustainable way. And then once we understand that, the way it works in a free market when all the prices are correct and the interest rate drops because there's more saving, then it's going to be a piece of cake to see, oh, what if the interest rate drops because the central bank just prints up a bunch of new money and gives it to the bankers? Well, then you're going to see how that gets all screwed up. Okay, But before we get to there, you need to understand the healthy functioning of a market economy. Okay. So... Well, that's what we're working up to, but right now, so this is a simplified diagram, and so all that was a big commercial to tell you why you really want to understand this particular diagram because we're gonna it's gonna get a little bit more complicated when we bring the capitalists in in the next chapter. But then once you, if you can understand that, then you're set. That's all you need to know to then illustrate savings and investment and capital accumulation. Okay, so here we're assuming joint ownership. So let me just walk you through this diagram. Okay, at the bottom, we've got consumer expenditures. 
this one stands for the first order, two is the second order, third order, fourth order good, fifth order good, sixth order good. So remember, in the Mengerian framework, after Karl Menger, he viewed the, the whole economy, the whole function or the whole rationale for an economy is consumption. That's the whole reason we work and all that stuff. And we do everything is ultimately to produce consumer goods. So that is the uh, the foundation of the system. That's why they're called first order goods. And then everything else is derived from them. So this sort of goes back to the causality argument. How is it that we know, how do we explain as Austrians the price of uh, land that can grow grapes that can be used to make champagne, we start from the fact that consumers value the champagne. And so that's how we explain the price of the champagne. And then we work backwards and we say, oh, because the champagne has this price, that means the grapes that make the champagne have a certain price. And then that means people who own land that is useful for growing those grapes they can rent it out for a certain price and so on. Right, so that the causality flows from consumer prices back up through the structure of production. So that's why the consumer goods get a one and then a two is the thing that is used in the step right before making the consumer good. And a three, a third order good, is a capital good that's useful in the construction of a second order capital good and so on. Okay. So let's see here. Um, big picture, what what this diagram is talking about is an economy where there are a hundred ounces of income every period, and likewise an expenditure of a hundred ounces on consumption. So. Here, the way you interpret this and what, what's going on with these shadings, in this last step here, what happens is the producers, the, the people who make the final consumption good, what they do is they spend 80 ounces of gold, because remember the money in this world is gold, they spend 80 ounces of gold buying a capital good from the second order producers. Okay, so there are people who are in business. They're the people in the second stage. Remember, they're all working collectively. And they sell a second order capital good. And the people in the first stage, and again, they're all like on a team, because remember, this is the only thing they're good for. The people in the first stage, the only thing they're useful for is producing the finished consumer good. So, but they to help them, they use this capital good. So they purchase the capital good from the second order people for 80 ounces of gold, and then they also, or sorry, and then they contribute their land. You know, their, their natural resources, whatever, you know, so if, if it involves agriculture or physical land, they do that. If there's some workers involved, you know, that part of this is labor, but they contribute a certain amount of labor to it, and then they turn around and sell the thing for 100 ounces. So of that revenue, of the 100 ounces that they earn, 80 of it they have to use to to get a second-order good to start the cycle again the next period, but 20 of it, they get to keep that their income for, for their own contributions. Okay, so let me say that again. So every period, when they let's let's say we start the period right before they sell the thing to their to the customers. Okay, so they have the stockpile of the consumer good, they sell it to the consumers and they earn 100 ounces of gold. But now, if they want to repeat this process next period, what do they do? 80 of that, they have to turn right around and use to buy the second-order capital good because that's what, you know, given its price and how many units they're going to buy, um, 
then that's what maybe they, I guess they just buy one unit probably. I think that's what Rothbard has in mind. I'm not sure. Okay, but they buy, no, not necessarily. They, they could buy multiple ones. All right, but they collectively spend 80 ounces buying capital goods from the second order producer. And for simplicity, just assume it's one good, just to keep things simple. And so of that 100 ounces, that means the remaining 20 now is the income earned by this people, you know, in team one. Because remember, there's some landowners, but in land in the generic sense, meaning natural resources, and there's some workers, and they're only good at producing good one, and they use this capital good too, second order capital good to help them. Okay? So, so that's their 20 ounces. Now, the second order, so the people now on team two, the people who are only good at producing that second order capital good, every period, what do they do? Well, they sell their, you know, again, let's start the analysis right when they have the finished product. So they have their capital good, their second order capital good. They sell it to team one and they get 80 ounces of gold from them. Uh, but 60 of those ounces, they have to turn right around and give it to team three because they use a third order capital good you know, team two uses a third order capital good. They don't just use their bare hands and raw resources from nature. They also use a good in process or, you know, a tool or something that team three makes, that team three specializes in making. Okay, and that costs them 60 ounces. So of the 80 that they receive from team one, they turn right around and spend 60 of it on team three, meaning the, the remaining 20 is what they pocket as their own income. And notice these 20s, they have the little arrows above them. It's that shooting you up here. Okay, and we'll, we'll see what that means in a minute. See, so let me just zip through this now. Okay, so now team three of the 60, well, in turn, they got to spend 45 of it on team four, and they only pocket 15. And then team four... Of the 45 they get in revenue, they have to spend 30 on Team 5's output of, a, of the fifth order capital, and they only pocket 15, and so on. Finally, we reach the highest stage. Um, so, so the Team 5, every period, you know, they get their 30, and then 20 of it they use to buy a sixth order capital good. But finally, we reached the top of the period. We've traced it all the way back, the structure of production all the way back. Team six, they don't use capital goods. They just use the raw natural resources, you know, gifts of nature that some people own, and labor power. And so team six, every period, they use their bare hands and the direct gifts of nature in order to make something that they then, you know, to make a sixth order capital good, which they then sell to Team 5 for 20 ounces of gold. Okay, so every period, what that means is the 20 ounces in revenue that Team 6 earns, they get to pocket it. That's their income free and clear because they don't have to spend it acquiring capital goods from anybody else. So notice now how this works. So Team 6 their income every period is 20. Team 5's is 10. Team 4's is 15 and so on. And if you add all those up, it adds up to 100. The 20 plus 10 plus 15 and so on. So that's what Rothbard was putting those arrows up because he was showing up here. If you sum it across the different stages, you know, 20, 10, 15, 15, 20, and 20, it adds up to 100. And that's not a coincidence because the consumers in this world are the owners. They're the same group of people. So every period, if the consumers have 20 ounces that down here they're spending on the consumer goods, the first order goods, so that's the only consumer good that exists. And so that's got to be the 100 ounces that they're earning collectively. All right, so it's... So it's kind of a neat little diagram, and it's a neat little system once you understand what it's saying. It's, and it's similar to 
what's called the circular flow diagram, which you get, which if you've taken, if you guys have taken a, a mainstream principles of economics class, you, you may have seen such a thing called a circular flow showing how consumers spend money buying products from businesses and then businesses take that and, you know, give dividends to the capitalists and give wages to the workers and give rental payments to the landowners and so on. And then, you know, that money just cycles right around again because those people spend it in their capacity as consumers. So it's just showing how money goes one way around the economy while goods go the other way. And it's just like a big circular flow, right? And that's partly why Mises talks about the evenly rotating economy. All right, so this, this economy right here that we just described is in an evenly rotating state. This thing just, this process keeps repeating itself period after period. And when, so once it gets to this position, it just, it just repeats. So notice, to get the ball rolling, takes six periods. Because in the beginning, you've got to wait. That these people, Team Six has to first start working in order to create a, a sixth order capital good. And then only next period can Team Five come online and start working with the sixth order capital good to create the fifth order capital good. So now, at the start of the third period, Team Four can finally start working. And then the next period, these guys, so you see what I'm saying? So if you started from nothing and there were no capital goods, it would take uh, one, two, I guess six periods before the first consumer goods would start shooting out of the pipeline. But the point is, once we settle down in the equilibrium, or we're in the evenly rotating equilibrium, then um, every period, 100 ounces worth of consumer goods shoot out of the pipeline. Okay? So, um, so that's how that diagram works. And the crucial thing here is there's no interest income that we're explicitly modeling here. And that's what this little side note means, that here Rothbard is assuming there's not a separate class of capitalists. What's happening is that the workers and the natural resource owners, they have to wait. So here, you know, these guys, the Team 6, for example, they use their bare hands and they start taking the natural resources and they're working on it. And depending on how long these stages are, I mean, maybe this represents a year. So maybe it takes them a year of working with their bare hands and using the gifts of nature in order to create sixth-order capital goods, which they then turn around and sell to Team 5 for 20 ounces of gold. So the point is these Team 6, during that year, had to just – work and not receive anything for it. They're all collectively joint owners, so they know once the product is made and they sell it to Team 5, they're all going to be the owners of that 20 ounces, but the point is they have to wait for it because initially they have nothing to show for it. You know, it takes time for them to create the sixth order capital good. So that that observation might actually make more sense to you once we see the role of the capitalist, okay? because that's what we're going to do in the next chapter, is we're going to introduce capitalists who advance payments to the landowners and the workers. And so that's going to give scope for an explicit um, portion of this being due to interest income. But right now, there, we don't see it. I mean, technically, interest income is being earned here, but it's all getting wrapped up into the payments to the land and labor factor. We're not splicing it out. Okay, why don't we, uh, well, I think that's the last slide. Okay, great. So we got about 10 minutes left. Let me go check the questions for the professor. Okay, Anthony says, when Rothbard talks about the evenly rotating economy, is this the same thing as the general equilibrium theory of Walras? I have heard that there is some disagreement within the Austrian school with some economists like Hayek and Schumpeter focusing more on analyzing general equilibrium, whereas Mises and Rothbard were more skeptical of this approach. Is this an accurate impression, and if so, could you comment on it? Uh, 
It was kind of a tricky question. Well, it, it depends what you mean when you say is the same thing. I mean, because and you could have a Walrasian general equilibrium that's not an evenly rotating economy. That you could. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. So. I don't know that Wal Ross himself dealt with this, but what I'm saying is you could imagine if you if you took if you went to grad school right now and you were you know studying general equilibrium theory, you could model something like a a pool of oil that was being drawn down over time. And you could talk about, you know, what would the what would the the general equilibrium price vector of that oil have to be over time? And you know the answer is it would the, the spot price of oil would rise with the rate of interest because you know the owner of an oil of the oil if it's a finite thing if it's just a pool you know he's got a he's got a million barrels of oil and if he sells a thousand barrels today then that means he has that you know he only has nine hundred ninety nine thousand barrels left to sell in the future you know if that's the guy's trade off so he wants to maximize the present market value, discounted market value of his asset, it, if you work out the equation, that what it turns out to is he's got to, given the demand for oil, he's got to draw it down such that the spot price of oil rises at this, you know, with the interest rate. So that, like, if the interest rate one, uh, the interest rate is 10%, and right now the price of oil is $100 a barrel, well, then next year the price of oil has to be $110 a barrel. And the reason the price goes up is because it becomes more scarce. All right, so that has to be true in equilibrium. So my point is you can model that sort of thing and you would be using a Walrasian general equilibrium framework and that wouldn't be an evenly rotating economy because the relative price of oil would be changing compared to the price of apples, which is not a finite resource. You know, there's not a fixed amount of apples that every time we eat one apple today, there's fewer apples for future generations. So there's no reason that the spot price of apples has to constantly go up, whereas in certain modeling assumptions of a general equilibrium model, a finite resource like oil, if we're if we're not finding new stock new deposits of it, if we just have what we have and are drawing it down, then yeah, the spot price is supposed to go up over time. So so no, I think they're actually different concepts. Specifically, the evenly rotating economy, there's no, so they're the same in the sense that there's no pure profit opportunities in either one. But a general equilibrium framework, uh, you can handle things changing over time. Like, give you a silly example, if, if the seasons change and the, uh, you know, the amount of, so, so the, the market value of, or the revenues earned by a ski resort would change. It's from summer to, to winter. Strictly speaking, in the evenly rotating economy, I mean, I guess if you looked it over the course of a year, you could average it out, but stuff like that gets a little bit tricky with the, with the way the evenly rotating economy is generally described. All right, so... Um, so, so to answer your question, no. Be, beyond the obvious that the evenly rotating economy is usually done in a verbal description, and while Rayesian general equilibrium is usually done in a mathematical approach with a bunch of equations pinning down what the equilibrium price vector is and so forth. Beyond that, even conceptually, I think that they're they're different. Uh, and then you're asking. Hayek and Schumpeter focused more on general equilibrium, while Mises and Rothbard were skeptical of it. Well, yeah, I think that's true, but, well, I, I'm not sure. M Mises and Rothbard were definitely skeptical. Yeah, that, yeah, I guess I would agree with that statement. Um, yeah, but there, the, just be careful. The difference is not, you don't want to say, oh, Mises and Rothbard adhere to the ERE, rather than while raising general equilibrium. 
And so that's why they were skeptical of General Lincoln. No, that's that's not right. If you're going to go that route with it, Mises and Rothbard are skeptical of general equilibrium theorists because they tended to take the equilibrium too seriously. They didn't realize that the real world was actually in disequilibrium, and they ignored the important equilibrating processes of the market. So, th so there, it, so it wasn't that Mises and Rothbard would be suspicious of Wall Rayan theorists because they don't like their particular equilibrium construct, and they said, no, don't use that, use the ERE. That, that wouldn't be the issue. The issue would be by focusing on the equations characterizing a general equilibrium in the Walrasian sense, they were overlooking the actual function that market prices serve in the real world. So, for example, in the socialist calculation debate, uh, the market socialists were basically relying on general equilibrium theory to try to come up with the central planner's solution to planning the economy. And so Mises and Rothbard were on Hayek, too, there would be very skeptical of that, but it wouldn't be because they were saying, oh, you should use the ERE instead. It's just them saying, you guys are assuming the planner would have all the information that you're plugging into these equations, when no, you wouldn't have that information. That's partly what a decentralized market economy does in practice. Okay, we're still okay here, so let me handle one more question and then um, I'm not going to be able to get to all the questions here so I'll, I'll catch up over the next day or two. Okay, Lewis says, Dr. Murphy, in your study guide you ask whether or not a landowner can earn interest in the ERE. Is it correct to say yes since time preference is a universal fact that holds even when the future is certain? I mean, there's still a rate of preference for, prefer for present goods over future goods, right? Yes, you're, you are right. It's funny. I think you were the, – the tricky part of that question wasn't whether interest can be earned at all. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the point of the ERE is to show the capitalists earn interest income, but the entrepreneurs don't earn pure profit. So the point of the ERE is to conceptually isolate the concepts of interest and profit. But where I was, why question 10 there was tricky is I was saying, can a landowner earn interest? Because normally we think that a landowner earns rent. And we think, oh, the capitalist earn, earns interest. But what I was getting at there is that, no, actually, even a landowner earns interest uh, in the following sense, that if you have... Because because the, the the asset that he owns is capitalized, that that's the the trick. So if the landowner owns a farm that's worth a million dollars, right? It has a market price of a million dollars, and he earns a rental income of uh, fifty thousand dollars, then you could say is he earning interest and I want to argue, although a lot of Austrians don't discuss this, I think it's undeniable to say that, yes, he is earning a rental income, that, you know, the marginal productivity of his land is the explanation for why sharecroppers are willing to pay him $50,000 a year for the use of his arable land. That's true. But I said also conceptually that $50,000 is interest on his financial capital because um, the the market price of his farm will be determined by the interest rate and the annual rents that it yields. All right, so the interest rate has to be 5% because the, the farm is worth a million dollars and the rental income is $50,000 a year. So I'm saying, in a sense, he's got financial capital of a million dollars, and he is earning a 5% annual return on that, just as surely as if he sold his farm, took the million dollars, and then bought a bond that yielded 5% per year. In that case, he would clearly have financial capital of a million dollars 
and at an interest rate of 5%, he'd be earning $50,000 each year in interest income. So I'm saying, you know, economically, he's still a capitalist, whether he invests in bonds or in real estate, he's still taking his million dollars of, you know, money right now that he might have in hand and then putting it either into the bond or putting it into real estate and then earning a perpetual stream of $50,000 in income forever for a 5% return. So I want to say that those those should both be considered as interest. Okay, but let me stress for everybody, that's not, I think that that's correct, what I just said, and that's why I put the question in there, but that's not something I have seen stressed in, in, in other Austrians' work. So I, like I said, I think it's correct, but um, if you ask this question to some other Austrian, he might not give you the same answer I did because, you know, and I, and I would argue if he heard my explanation, then he would say, oh, yeah, right, Bob's right, that is the way we got to do it. But um, this, is, this is something that I found in Irving Fisher, and, I've been, you know, and I stress when I teach at Mises U and stuff, but this is not standard, uh, a standard point that people bring up in terms of Austrian economics. But again, I, I think it's correct. That's why I'm saying it. But it's uh, just just be careful that that's that's not boiler boilerplate praxeology. Okay, well, we're a little bit over time, and I taught the earlier class today, so I'm kind of wiped out myself. So why don't we stop there? And like I say, I will catch up on your uh, questions. And for those of you again who are new to this. Just be looking out for an email that I will send Thursday at some point, perhaps in the evening, explaining to you that the you know when you have to take the quiz if you're taking a class for credit and so on. Okay, so thanks everybody, and I will see you next time.